You all right? Or the world around you. Uh, and normally I'm peeling the skins off of dead rats and that, but now once a week I get to come on air and talk to you about what I assume is going to be utter shite. And I've had a bit of feedback about last week's show, and I'm going to take it on board a bit more music and try to explain my points a bit more because I forget that other people can't hear my thoughts and see my memories and that. So with that in mind and taking on the advice from last week, let's start off with a song, eh? Here's one of uh, Classified's new songs, Pick Your Poison. They are. Now, oh, grab your fucking mugs, boys and girls, and you should probably throw a couple extra scoops of those beans in there, because what's the point of it being called Double Drop Coffee if you're not going to do it? Besides, even though I've got all that advice, I imagine you're really going to need that extra energy to follow the next 50 minutes or so of this. So, getting started. What's something that you believe where... You think you might be the only person in the world who believes it. And I'll, I'll get you going. I think we're slowly being introduced to the idea of aliens entering our world, but from beneath, possibly even from the sea. Even if you just use the Bible, they say that God made something that separated the waters. So what if that's just a barrier between here and Agartha? Uh, Agartha, for those that you don't know, would be the hollow earth. Think about it, though. There's... This species of creature called the krill, and I think that the krill can photosynthesize, the only animal that can, but I'm not 100% sure. But even if that's, it, whether that's true or not, that sounds out of this world, doesn't it? it well, it gets deeper. Yeah, it gets a lot deeper. Not not by a luminescent fish like anglerfish deep, but still, you know, deep. 2% of America is allergic to shellfish. So that's at least 0.0009, that's three zeros, of the world's population, or just under 152 million people are allergic to shellfish. If we liberally apply those numbers and have nothing more than a rudimentary secondary school level understanding of maths and how numbers work in general, that's enough to wipe out all of Russia if the krill decided to, to wipe out anyone that they could take out the whole of Russia. Now, I'm not saying that the krill are working for someone, rather that... There are some people out there who are working for the krill. Going back to religious texts, the Bible denies people the right of eating shellfish. Could this be to protect the shellfish from being discovered or from being over farmed so that they're not domesticated and lose their natural instinct to control the world? As a little side note, there seems to be a huge influx in population since the 1940s, which is weird considering what was going on in the world at that time. But what if the krill made their moves back then? What if that's where what we were all actually fighting, all standing shoulder to shoulder, battering crustaceans left, right and centre? But because the Krill won, they were able to rewrite history and create this whole narrative about World War Two, when in fact the atrocities on both sides were actually by those sunlight transforming six-legged monsters, which, by the way, collectively weigh at least 370 million tonnes between them, whilst the people allergic to them only weigh 10 million tons so they're outnumbered in that sense and this can easily be considered a threat to at least those people and just sticking with the krill's connection to the way the world is run and influenced a huge influence on western culture is disney and they released their first feature length film snow white and the seven dwarfs in 1938 a couple of years before the huge rise in population began was this film put out so that children could be indoctrinated into the way of the shrimp was it was it put out nothing to do with shrimp was it or was it just a ploy by the shrimp because they knew they were going to need more hands to work so they made this film about oh this woman who's really pure she's snow white very pure um she's got seven dwarfs which you could look at as seven children that she's got to look after and she's had all these kids and she's still pure she's still great she's still good you know but she still had seven kids now is that the reason why loads of people had kids in that time because of snow white and because of disney there's actually loads of television and movie references to Krill, which I'll get into in a minute, but it seems wrong to only mention Western culture and not Eastern culture, so let's touch on Eastern culture for a moment. There's a lot of fish eaten in the, in the East, in the Far East anyway, and what are fish other than a shrimp's main predator? The Krill want to lower the numbers of fish threatening their existence, and have been fighting a war against the Krill for years, like we us lot have, the, the people, by dumping plastic in the oceans, the plastic floats and stops the phyloplankton from taking in sunlight. There's, there's a good chance I'm wrong, actually, you know, about the krill. I've done a little, I don't do much research, but I thought that didn't sound right before, so I did a little bit of pause, it went another look, and it's not actually the krill that photosynthesise, I think it's, um, I think it's the plankton that does that. But anyway, this algae, this algae stuff, that's what the krill thrive off, they, they need that to eat, they need that to live. And by refracting and actually blocking the sunlight, 
we can stop the sunlight from hitting the algae and lessen the food source of the krill and maybe put a dent in their numbers. But in the yeast, they also used to eat an awful lot of whales. Whales eat literally a shitload of krill. They're, they're perfectly evolved for eating krill. In fact, they've got them weird like toothbrush mouths, haven't they, with the massive like hair coming down for teeth. Recently, we've heard lots about recycling and stopping dumping things in the oceans by, you know, all these nutters that are environmentally friendly and all that, you know. But what if it's because the krill now own the media and all? Or at least they've got a huge influence over the media and what disinformation that the media chooses to spread. Well, the krill don't control me, guys. I say and do what I want on a daily basis. I'm Jack, the world around you, here at Threshold FM. Here's Kumbaya. That was Hopsin, Kumbaya. You're probably thinking, thank fuck that all that shrimp talk's over. Wrong. Fucking wrong, me. I'm I'm on one about shrimp, and I think it's because my pet shrimp died, which sounds like a weird bit in it. But I did have a pet shrimp. He was a little bamboo shrimp, and I purposely didn't give him a name because I thought that'd make him die sooner. You know, like when you get when you get a little budgie or a canary or some goldfish and that, and you name him. Normally, the thing that you name dies, doesn't it? Like, doesn't tend to happen with dogs and cats and that, but does tend to happen with fish. Does with me anyway. So I didn't want to give him a name, and unfortunately, he still died. You know, he was. And he was one of the domesticated shrimp, though, you know, he's fresh water too, so not directly and no links at all, really, to the depths of Agatha. And he was he was always there. He was proud of me as well, you know. I know that my bamboo shrimp was proud that I stopped watching terrestrial TV, which is potentially controlled by the shrimp and his sort of uh, cousins, let's say, his evil cousins. And I just stuck to Netflix. So that's no news. I'm not taking in any news. There's no shrimps rotting my mind. Anyway, let's get into some of those Krill references off the telly and that and off the films. Recently, the Krill were a bunch of aliens in the new Captain Marvel, well, the late one of the latest Marvel films, Captain Marvel. But they've also been recurring characters in the Marvel comics since 1967. They're, they're a militarised species moving from planet to planet, and I believe they can shapeshift, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, just like in The Orville, that weird sci-fi programme by Seth MacFarlane, and when I say weird, I mean not funny, and I don't... I don't understand if it was supposed to be funny. But uh, from uh, 2017, I don't know if they had a second series. I can't imagine they did. Uh, they, they were, the Krill were also in Doctor Who. And it's a bit of a reach. But in Dragon Ball Z, you've got Krillin. Literally the name Krillin. I'm not saying that it's got Krillin. K-R-I-L-L-I-N. And he starts off as an enemy to Goku. And Goku, I think, was a human. Just with powers. And... He quickly becomes very close to Goku, the main fighter in the cartoon. Could this be a psyops of sorts to make people think that the Krill are our friends and to eradicate the notion of the Krill being against the humans? They don't just invade your house through our TV screens though as well. They also invade through the postal system because they can arrive in the post and they have been doing for decades. Years ago, you could mail order these things called sea monkeys, which are just brine shrimp. They're just the sort of things you feed to a goldfish if, you know, you've got a bit more money and you can afford something more than flake. They, they come as an egg in a little paper sachet, properly dried out, and they can survive for decades, apparently, whilst they're dried out. And they're just, what are they doing in there? You know, they're just waiting, mate. Waiting like whatever is inside the moon is waiting for something to, to open it up, to hatch it, to give it the right conditions, to plant it, to to fertilise it. I don't know, but I, I, they're waiting for that perfect moment, mate. Or they're still alive in the eggs and they're acting as reconnaissance when unsuspecting children dump them into the little glass bowls as well. Then they come back to life and they can send all the signals and all the things they've learned from the postal system. Imagine what you could learn from the postal system by just recording where the letters go. You would learn so much about the infrastructure of a, of a world, of a, of a population. Because they reach everywhere, don't they, the postal service, and maybe that's what the krill are trying to do by getting in the post. Rather than this, these sea monkeys simply being a way to make these measly shrimp sound cooler, could it be also a, a reference to the aliens that apparently interfered with ape DNA to create us, the humans? Perhaps they first messed with these aquatic apes and caused all of them to die out, meaning that they could gain control of the seas. But maybe something went wrong when they applied their otherworldly DNA to the land-dwelling apes and realised that they would need more CO2 in the atmosphere to be able to dominate the dry lands. That's why they decimate plankton populations, phyloplankton create oxygen, which is great for fish, whales and humans, but it's really bad for the krill. So, could it be that the, the krill are terraforming the earth for themselves? Or perhaps the krill are actually a race of aliens that landed in the sea rather than came from beneath the crust of the earth. 
Maybe in the 20th century, they made breakthroughs in contacting the humans they created and distracted them with technology, environmentally dangerous technology and all, you know, that pumps poisonous gases into the atmosphere, like uh, cars, vans, factories. Uh, they all pumping out CO2, which damages plant life and increases the temperature of the earth. Now, I'm unsure why they would want it to get warmer. I'm not too sure because that would lower the sea level. So maybe they're not actually... They don't, maybe they don't actually need to live in the sea. Maybe they just hide out there. Maybe they're in like a, as a shrimp. Maybe the shrimp are a, like a larval form, a larval stage of the reptilian aliens, perhaps. I don't know. I'm not an expert. Uh, maybe the, the, the warm and the planet heating up is just a byproduct. Or maybe they're not the larval form of it. Maybe the krill are just being used by another species. Perhaps the, the you know, the tall whites or the, the reptilians that supposedly lurk in the fifth dimension who knows but i bet getting all those tvs into people's houses created emissions you've got obviously they can use the tvs to influence people with the films and the media that's on them the krill they can they can teach people what they want people to learn and what they want people to believe and change their perceptions they got the all the emissions from the delivery lorries so they're the delivery lorries and the boats that are bringing in all the, the resources you've got the mining of the resources which is damaging the damaging the environment and and even the manufacturing process, mate, that's gonna that's gonna damage the environment and cause harm to the humans, and that's what the krill want, isn't it? And imagine if they could, they just keep making TVs bigger and bigger and bigger. Like they used to be like the size of a palm of your hand kind of thing, and now the like some of them are bigger than my wingspan, you know. Look, like some you've got the ones in the cinema, mate. They're fucking they're massive. So just next time you're in the cinema, you look at a big screen, think to yourself how much. How how much has the krill paid? How much have the shrimp paid? How much how hard? How long did it take for the shrimp to to plan this? And how many emissions have been put out by this massive TV screen here? Eh? Because they they used to have them tubes in it in it as well. I think it was in a game I played called Thunderbrook. Don't know if it's true, but the the old TVs used to have a tube that would literally give off radiation as well. So that will alter your DNA. So maybe they had to alter the DNA that the the the, the apes, the land dwelling apes that they'd already interfered with and that had eventually evolved into humans as we know now. Maybe they also needed a little bit more radiation to give them a little bit of more of a push so that they could interfere with the DNA again. I was watching Abducted in Plain Sight the other night on Netflix about this guy that abducts and manipulates a young girl by seducing both of her mum and her dad. But he convinced the girl that she was a part of a mission to save the world concerning some aliens. That she was part alien and that he was an alien. But he later tells some nuns he's in the CIA and he dumps her at a convent, I think. It's well worth a watch, but it got me thinking, isn't it weird that aliens tend to come in pairs? They, not your Tuscumbian space penguins or your, your Loveland frogmen of Ohio. They didn't come in pairs, they were in little groups. But you named aliens that have a name like uh, or they have a they have a relationship where it's a pair like i think there was a uh, george bush and was it j rod or r rod or t rod or something you had um i want to say roosevelt but i could be wrong or uh, hoover was it hoover that had um val valiant thor the val valiant thor was connected with some president anyway and it there's a pair there, and Val Valiant thought I did have a little team, though, so it kind of goes against it. But you've got Enki and Enlil in the Anunnaki stories. In the Bible, you've got the angel Gabriel, who's cooking God. Uh, they're not quite coming in pairs, but they kind of come together, because Gabriel uh, came inside the Virgin Mary, and that was God's own ejaculate. So together, they, they came together as a, as a pair. And we're led to believe that anyway. And obviously, Enki and Enlil had a bunch of other alien brethren knocking around with them to aid in the alleged molestation and raping of the newly created human race. Not too dissimilar from how Zeus used to try and fuck pretty much anything that was mortal in the stories believed by the ancient Greeks. Pairs of aliens is such a noticeable trope that the rapist fella in Abducted in Plain Sight invented a pair of aliens to aid in the molestation of the young girl. They were called Zeta and Zethra. And they were used to coerce the girl into allowing the bloke to shag her. I don't really think it mattered if she was going to allow him or not by this point, because the guy's pretty invested in it. He's bought the tape recorder, he's, he's bought the caravan, he's got the caravan pitch, which is, everyone knows that's difficult, isn't it, to get somewhere where you can keep your caravan. And he's already gotten off with a mum, and he's gotten a quick ham shank off of a dad in the car, so it's only a matter of time at this point, really, that he's going to have his way with this little girl. In his mind, anyway, and unfortunately, in reality. But the raping's not important here. I'm not focusing on the rape. I'm only focusing on the names of the aliens. And the fact that there's two of them. Now, I'm not saying the aliens were real. But just like fictional aliens Kang and Kodos from The Simpsons, their names are very similar. Now, 
it seems pretty lazy from a creative standpoint. And are we to believe that people that made, you know, what was it, 500 episodes of The Simpsons, maybe more, 30 series, maybe 20 episodes a series, were they lazy? Probably not at the beginning, not really towards the end, maybe in the middle. But Kang and Kodo seem pretty lazy names, but they follow the same sort of pattern as Zeta and Zethra. Very short, very snappy. Very, they start with the same letter, sound very similar. Uh, you know, is there some reason behind it all? There must be. There must be a reason why he chose Zeta and Zethra because he planned everything else. He must have planned the names and Kang and Kodos must have reference as well to something. Is there is there a pair of aliens that rule the world with two names that sound similar to each other? Uh, the rapist goes on to uh, to later. Spoiler alert, as I should say. I probably should have said this at the start. Um, he goes. He works for the CIA, and he takes the kid to some nuns, and he, he dumps the kid with him. But what if this is what the CIA was actually doing at the time? What if he was actually CIA? Maybe he was dumping the kid there for the aliens and leaving them in the convent so that the nuns could tell the priests, "Oh, we've got one here who's pretty depressed. You want to come and harvest the negative energy in that?" Because we know that America's already it's rife with well, allegedly rife with child trafficking and molestation. But what if there's a reason, much like the idea I had, that I just briefly went on there, about Catholicism in a sort of, how it's a sort of organised crime, but the money's irrelevant, the money's like a cover story. Really, the priests are harvesting the negative energy from their subjects and their rape victims, like the little boys that ring the bells at the start of Mass, which is then harvested by the bishops, which is eventually fed back through a chain of command all the way up to the Pope, who then feeds or gives this all of this negative energy as a tribute to the alien overlords or these extra dimensional beings that feed off of the world's negative energy that are always going to be there like the hyenas say at the end of the lion king we'll always be here and uh, that's that's something i spoke about in one of my podcasts where the like the, the hyenas were like the the extra dimensional beings well but you anyway why would the cia be trying to rape kids and get them used to aliens is it because that they the cia are, are aliens is it to protect the world? Are the CIA actually at a time police or men in black that serve the earth or protect the earth and relevant timelines? We already know that MK Ultra was a thing, a fucking nasty thing where the Americans had raped kids and teenagers in order to cause trauma so that they could fracture their minds and rebuild their brains to create uh, quote unquote super soldiers or otherwise brainwash people so that they can use them to manipulate uh, society or small groups of society later on. And that I don't know much about it, I know a bit, but I'd, I'd love to have a chat with someone about it. I'd love to have an interview on here with someone who has read or thinks they know a lot about MK Ultra. I don't mind if you don't actually know much at all, if you just make it all up, mate. You'll feed my mind, and you'll probably feed other people's, but MK Ultra is this whole massive thing that's both terrifying to me and really interesting. Because it seems like if it had happened to you, you wouldn't really know it had happened to you. Because you're sort of hypnotised away from it. So what if that's what happens to us all? Like when we're at school or something. And have you ever thought as well, just fairly cooking quick, nothing to do with anything. But you know when you're in school and you get given that them bottles of milk and everyone gets given the milk and the breadsticks. Now, you get given breadsticks to make your throat dry out so you're really thirsty. So you will drink the milk to force you to drink that milk. Now, what's in the milk? Is there something in the milk? I never used to drink the milk. Uh, doctors thought I was lactose intolerant as a kid so I never drank it and look at me now I didn't drink the milk and you know I've got thoughts and I've got my own ideas and that I don't know what everyone else from school's doing I don't know if they still carried on to drink milk I drink milk now but I don't drink milk that's made for kids to drink in schools anyway that's a whole different thing with the MK Ultra thing there's loads of room for speculation too so i think it'd be nice to have a discussion about what you think about it what i think about it so send us a message me if you if you'd like to come on here and you actually know some stuff about it and that you maybe you've read a book or a pamphlet or seen a poster with it on what if the way we perceive the church is relatively new what if the structure in use now is is relatively new as well allowing for the harvesting of emotions like that what if that's the reason why america is so mad into god and the idea of this all seeing eye Perhaps the all-seeing eyes are a representation of the extra-dimensional beings being able to see us but not properly interact with us either due to physical or metaphysical restriction. You know, like whatever basically stops ghosts from touching the physical realm. The, the pyramid could be the hierarchical structure of organised religion with the eye right at the top. But it could also be, the, could the pyramid not be, has anyone ever thought the pyramid could just be a sign of a prison where someone's trapped the all-seeing eye within this, this prison and the... 
they can't interact with outside of this prison but they can see out of it and people can potentially see into it if they look for it but they can't properly interact with it they can only see it and perceive it they can't actually do anything with it are we the eye the now it is oh, I, I don't know how to how to say this but what i'm thinking is are they doing this are the church doing this to protect our home is it is it a symbiotic relationship between organized paedophilia and literal monsters? Is it all just pure conjecture? I'd like to think there's some horrible convoluted logic based in theology and science on the, the priests and their part for why they do it. Uh, is it is it just done through the fear that they all have of these aliens? Or even worse, is it all coincidental and there just happen to be loads of loads of rapists knocking about who also happen to be blokes in like their early 30s who also just happen to be, uh, you know, blokes that like wearing dresses, who also just happen to be blokes who like wearing dresses just on a Sunday morning, who also just happen to like ramming it up little boys' asses. It's it's a question. I think it's one of the questions of the age. It's it's not worth dwelling on, but it's, it's a question. And you can't live your life like that, worrying about stuff like that. And if you or a loved one has been or is being molested by someone, please, please do something about it. I'm not taking a piss out of you, innit? I'll be taking a piss out of a paedophile every every time, probably. I, why not? Why not make fun of perverts? They shouldn't be protected. They, they We should rip, ridicule them because they're, they're fucking kids. But I, you've got now to be ashamed of if, if you're being molested or out. Do do something about it, innit? If, you, don't kill them. Fucking don't kill them. You'll just ruin your life and then they win. But leave notes in windows, maybe in the front window or in, in other people's, in your car window, you know, like uh, if some people have honk if you're horny. Uh, you could write, I'm honking because I get fiddled. And you just keep driving around, beeping the horn, you know, or I, I honk because I'm fiddled. Uh, you just drive around doing that. You'll get people's attention. You'll make a bit of a dick of yourself initially, but it will bring you the help that I would imagine you would need. Uh, you could You could run away. You could go, go and tell a security guard in a shop or a librarian. Them guys never have anything to do. Neither of them. Security guards are always just standing around and librarians are just always sitting around. So tell them, mate. A security guard would probably be happy for the little ego boost of thinking, fucking hell, someone thinks I'm, you know, can help them. Rather than thinking, oh, the only people I ever deal with are people I've tried to steal toasters and they never want out to do with me. Um, And the, the librarians... The librarians, all they're going to do is tell people to shut up. So if you walk around the, the library going, Me, uh, I've been touched by Tig Biddy Dave. Tig Biddy Dave keeps trying to grab me. You know, the, the Tig Biddy, he's, he's, he's always there. He's always knocking about. He's outside now in his van. You start shouting that in a library, mate, people are going to take notice. People are going to pay attention. That librarian is going to come over and tell you to shut the fuck up. Do you not know we're in a library? And then you say, no, are you not listening to a word I say? Tig Biddy Dave has been trying to grab me from his van. Shut telling me, come and have a look at me sweets. Oh, come in here and I've got a pack of chewits and a pack of fruit cellar. What do you prefer? You can have half and half of each, you know. Or just, if you're young, tell all of your teachers. Some of your teachers won't care. They, they won't give a shit because it's not worth what they're paid. They're not paid enough to really deal with that. But some of them will care about their students. Very few and far between in my experience. But you've got now to be ashamed of. They're the ones in the wrong. The teachers that don't care about the students are obviously in the wrong. But, I mean, the rapists, the molesters, they're in the wrong. Don't plan to tell someone. Just do it whenever you get the chance. Tell your neighbours. Go full on Macaulay Culkin. Write a letter. Uh, tie it round a brick and dash it through a window like in Home Alone 2. Uh, try to avoid the whole like real life side of uh, Macaulay. Was it was it heroin that that got him? I mean, I know people say that oh they must have had a tough paper round when someone who's reasonably long, young looks quite old. And I guess his Saturday job was um, I think working on a ranch that um, that very special ranch with the the fairground rides and he was getting railed up the arse by what looked like an actual fucking alien there. Uh, we don't. I'm not going to go into the whole Michael Jackson thing. That's another. I would like to go into celebrities and paedophile celebrities and have a laugh at them. You know, take the piss out of them. But we need something a bit cheerier now, don't we? Something a bit. So here's a song that can give you some better life lessons than anything I could ever give you. Uh, this is the Manor, and this is their tune. Live for the moment. I think it's weird that over time we've developed different alphabets 
as ways of representing the same sounds. I know that Japan's got at least three. They've got hiragana, katagana, and kanji, maybe more. And there's a couple of variants on the English one, like the, the German one's got umlauts, the English one doesn't, the, like the British one doesn't, uh, but it's still the same lettering, you know, and they've got that weird thing for a double S that looks like a capital B, but it's been drawn by maybe a left-handed person. And there's other ones through Europe, but think about the old ones, the proper old ones, not as far back as like your hieroglyphs, but nearly. Go Go back to ancient Greece. They're their alphabet. And we've mentioned Zeus before, and that got me thinking, what if all of this with the aliens started around that time? Or at least around the time of documenting the Greek gods and the lives of the ancient Greeks. In the Greek alphabet, they don't have a C, as in the letter C. Obviously, they had the C around them. I think they were an island nation, weren't they? But at least they might still be. I'm sure Greece is an island. But they, just the very fact that I've even had to reaffirm that it's the letter C and not the wet bit of the world tells us something and all. It's disinformation, isn't it? It's a, it's a chance for getting rid of that from them. They, they use gamma, the ancient Greeks. They use gamma, alpha, beta, gamma. Not A, B, C or R, B, C. It's alpha, beta, gamma. So what if that was their first bit of interference with the krill from the krill? That was the first bit of interference from the krill and the human population of the world. But apart from obviously making us first with the DNA. But perhaps the gods of old didn't pass down the letter C to the Greeks because that could potentially mean that they could change the way they worship by doing that, by getting rid of the letter C and changing C to a G. They could make them overprotective with something other than nature itself because people seem to used to really care about nature and then ever, all of a sudden, I kind of flip of a, the flip of a switch, everyone seems to only care about gods. So how did they do that? And see... To get there, and bearing in mind with the you know the feedback I got of explain how you got to your thoughts, I'll try and tell you how I got there. To the shrimp, I would imagine that an Arctic cod or whatever other variant of cod is a huge threat because it would be one. It's going to eat them, and if they wanted to take over the world, the last thing they need is all the apes worshiping and protecting fish, even farming fish and making fucking more of them exist. The krill don't want that, and one of the biggest predators of the ocean-dwelling shrimp are the fish. Obviously, the, the literally the biggest is whales, but so by simply eradicating the letter C, they've potentially introduced the concepts of gods rather than fishermen being fixated on fish like cods. They're now fixated on appeasing the gods rather than looking for the fish of the oceans. In reality, the fish were what could once save us from the mass extinction event being brought upon us by the krill, the next great flood. Just like in the tales of Gilgamesh and Noah, why else would something flood the world if it wasn't so that they could live there? But if the shrimp do manage to flood this world like they supposedly flood the other worlds, then that would mean the fish and the whales had survived too. And they needed to get rid of that threat. And I just want to show you how one simple change can change everything in the world. And the aliens didn't allow for the letter C, they changed it to gamma. Because back then, they knew that from a human point of view, only cod can save us now. And they didn't want us to know it. And it's weird to think that all these six-legged creatures and to think about them just knocking about and, and making love to our women but perhaps that's why the ancient greeks were so welcoming of all different types of sex group sex gay sex straight sex probably the odd animal was thrown in for a fucking and all as a, as a side note i've always wondered if i was to fuck an animal what would it be not that i do or i would but why and what would be my reasoning behind it i wouldn't want to fuck a pig because they've got those proper sharp hairs, you know, like when you're butchering them now, and they've got the really thick, hard hairs. You wouldn't want them in your thighs, it'd put you off your stroke, wouldn't it? So that'd be horrible, and that stabbing sensation in your thigh, I'm not, I'm not about that. And they can't look you in the eye either when, you, when you're when you taking them from behind, and because they can't twist the neck all the way around because of the way the neck's developed. And they can't look up either when they're, you know, when they're sucking you off and giving you a blowy, because a pig can't do that. Like a, a cow might be able to do that, or a sheep, but... They're a bit big, aren't they? Like a, a cow's mouth is a bit big. You're going to just feel sort of emasculated if you start putting your dick in a cow's mouth. So what what would you want? What animal would you like to, to, to fuck? And not not like, oh, because I think dogs are beautiful, but I want I want a reason, like a genuine reason. Oh, I've always thought to myself, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to shag a box jellyfish because, you know, they're dangerous and I like a bit of danger. But like I'd, I'd want to probably want to, would want to fuck something super dangerous, like a massive spider, mate, the size of a car, you know, all them legs to work with and all them down, or a shark, or, you know, something that would just be a right laugh, you know, like a, like a, imagine fucking a spider monkey, mate, or a gibbon. Maybe that's what Jim Jones was trying to do when he was knocking about on people's houses, selling them all spider monkeys. But I, I can never narrow it down. I can never decide. So let me know. 
find us on Twitter at World Around You and send a tweet to at World Around You. What animal you'd like to fuck given half the chance? I'm not going to judge you. Just tell me what you'd like to rattle and why. Uh, anyway, back to shrimping orgies. Perhaps the shrimp introduced orgies to the masses of ancient Greece so that they could, one, collect more skin suits because they're going to need them or the reptilians are going to need them. And two, to not be noticed in the orgy. Who's keeping track of legs? You know, you've got, you've got six legs on a shrimp there. You, you're gunning for a very particular part of the body and the knees. Personally, have never been of interest to me. I can honestly say I've never really cared if a woman's knees even work. I, I don't I don't look at knees and go, oh, oh. oh they're fucking, they're, they're good looking knees then. Never done it, mate. Who does fucking weirdos? Uh, you know, uh, he, I've never looked at someone and gone, she's got a pretty face, got, 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 got good boobs, but her knees don't work or they don't look right. I couldn't give a shit, mate, you know, but, you know, what can, what can I say, man, I'm a, I'm a gentleman, you know. Maybe everyone knew anyway that these massive shrimp were fucking the high society of Greece, but that's just made me realise I've assumed something about the shrimp there as well. I've assumed that the, the human-sized shrimp, what if they skin their farmed people and fill the skins with billions of shrimp? People were smaller back then and all, so maybe not the modern day equivalent of a dwarf height, which was uh, supposedly 147 centimetres and below. Uh, I mean, 147 centimetres a person, fat or thin, that's a fucking lot of shrimp to fill it, isn't it? And I reckon you'd notice even back then, because people weren't stupid. They'd still been educated and had common sense, but we all know that a skin, ba a skin bag full of live shrimp and brine would be all floppy and probably be pretty dense and all, be like a waterbed, it'd be weird. The orgies could have even been some form of breeding party so that the shrimp people of the sea could create half-breeds to do their bidding for them on land. And what if these orgies were super exclusive or just few and far between? Would you really care if you're, if you're fucking a bag of shrimp or if, you, if you're just having sex with a shrimp man or a shrimp woman? Would you care because it means that you're in high society and you're being included in that so it's a status symbol, you know... It, uh, who cares, you know, if, if you can be with the with the kings and the princes and the leaders and the queens and the princesses and the 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 highest rungs of ancient Greece society, ancient Greek society? Would you care if you're shagging a keratin sack full of salt water and crustaceans? Because you know, when life gives you lemons, that was "Lemon" by Conway the Machine and Method Man. New tune there. Also, possibly the the cleanest segue of the episode. And I think we've gotten towards the end there, guys. That's got to be about an hour there and thereabouts. On a completely unrelated note, uh, I got into the papers recently for making portable i5 machines out of disembodied rat paw. So it's a little little rat's paw on a spring. And you can give an i5 an extra couple inches for COVID distancing, you know. So go and give that a look in the New York Post. Hopefully any answers... Uh, that you need from questions raised by hearing that statement uh, will be answered in the interview that I gave with the couple that scares together, which is a podcast that you can apparently now find on YouTube, but you'll definitely find it on Spotify, Spreaker, Anchor, whatever else that exists. Uh, I don't know where else you can find podcasts, but wherever you find your podcast, go and give them a listen. Find it. It's Portals to Hell episode. I've got an interview on there. You don't have to tell them it was me that sent you, but tell them that you listen so that they know that what they're doing isn't a waste of their time. If not, find me... You know, find me your questions and I'll try and answer them for you. Um, and I'm hoping for you that I'm hoping that for your sake, this show started with a bit of smoke around you, in, in or around you. And if not, we're definitely ending with some. Here's something to bring you down from all the stuff I've just filled your head with. Something to, you know, ease you into the next next part of your day. A little bit less sort of like padded hour and a bit more sort of now easing and relaxing. Anyway, I'm Jack, the world around you, and according to the New York Post, Britain's wackiest taxidermist, this was Pause for Thought on Threshold FM, and this is Blackberry Smoke with Run Away From It All.